we'll be talking about cleansing the temple. So cleaning house. We're going to talk about clean house. So what do I mean by that? I mean, when Jesus went into the temple and he ran out the, the money changers, the people that sold doves and things like that, we're going to be ex explaining what the symbolic meaning was of that for our hearts when we give our will over to Jesus Christ when we follow him. Hallelujah. Let's get started. Number one, checks out the temple, then curses the fig tree. Mark 11, 11 to 14. It said, Jesus entered Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking around at everything, he left for Bethany with the twelve, since it was already late. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in the leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. He said to him, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples were listening. So we notice right here that Jesus went into the temple first. And he seen something. He seen what was going on. And he left. And he went to go pray on it. A lot of times this is what Jesus does with us. He comes and he checks us out to see what's going on. And what happens is he comes back and begins to correct and instruct. So we find this out right here. In that he curses the fig tree. And this is going to be a symbolic meaning right here too. Because after he gets done clearing everything out, he goes through and the, and the fig tree withers. And I really believe that he meant that in context. He was pretty much showing that what he's seen in the temple, it wasn't bearing no fruit. And if we bear no fruit and we refuse to change, this is exactly what happens. We wither. We're, we're cursed. It isn't that Jesus curses us. We are cursed from the ways that we are going without following him fully. So we begin to see right here, it does say that Jesus cursed the fig tree, but Jesus had every right because that fig tree bore no fruit. It wasn't bearing any fruit. That's why, why it's very important that we must bear fruit in Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go ahead and continue. Number two, Jesus came back to clean his house. Mark 11, 15 to 16. Then they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple. And overturned the tables of the money changers and seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. So we begin to see right here, he came to Jerusalem. Now now he came right back to Jerusalem after he got done doing all this stuff with the fig tree. And when he went out to Bethany for that night, you begin to find out that he enters. And actually the book of John talks about he had cords and he began to swing them around. We don't know if he hit anybody or not. It's possible. It didn't say it didn't. It didn't say it did exactly. I don't believe so. But... Anyways, he was swinging those around and they began to get out of the way. Now, notice one thing here. Before this, before Mark 11, 11, right before that, you begin to find out that they were just saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they were giving over their life to the Lord, acknowledging him as the Messiah, the Son of God, who is God. So as soon as we begin to acknowledge that, we're saying, Jesus, have your way in my life. This is exactly what he does. He comes in and he clears the temple. Temple here is the same word for house, actually, and you're beginning to find out too when it talks about house of prayer. It's the same Greek word as when he was talking about when a demon comes back to the house. It's the same type of Greek word. So we, we find out right here as well that he meant the same type of thing. He's talking about his house now. Why is it his house? Because when they acknowledge him as Lord, it became his house, and now he has to do a cleansing. That's why we get disciplined. Those he loves, he disciplines. So let's continue right here and explain this, where it goes on to say, begin to drive those out who are buying and selling in the temple. He overturned, overturned there in Greek means he was upset. It means upset. So the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves, selling there. In the Greek, it means to trade or to be busy. So that can also mean, you know, it can also mean selling as well, but that also means that we can trade the Holy Spirit, dove here, symbolic for Holy Spirit. Remember, the dove came down on Jesus. It was symbolic for the Holy Spirit coming down. It was as if a dove, the Spirit had come down on him. So with that, this is symbolic meaning for the Holy Spirit. So we can be too busy for the Holy Spirit for one, and we can trade the Holy Spirit for two. If, he does, if we do not allow him to come into our hearts and cleanse us, we can do these things. That's why it's very important we follow him, do not give up, keep seeking him through his word and spirit, because they both come together and in truth. Hallelujah. So with that, money changers here, that's material. He has to wipe away all the world inside our life, in our heart, in our house, in our temple. 
So we continue on down. He would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. So that's what he says now. We, don't, we do not live the same lifestyle we once lived. That is a true follower of Jesus Christ. They don't live the same lifestyle. And if they are struggling in that lifestyle, they eventually come out of it because they know one who is going to bring them through. It's Jesus Christ. You keep going towards him and he will cleanse you. But we have to be obedient to his word. So let's continue. Number three, his house is a house of prayer. Mark eleven seventeen to 18. And he began to teach and say to them, is, is it not written? My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a robber's den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him. For they were afraid of him, for the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. So we see right here, he began to teach and say to them, when he cleanses his temple out, we can acknowledge his teaching. We can't acknowledge Jesus' teaching if we remain the same. If I remain the same and I don't ever surrender anything more in my life, and I hear the words of Jesus, I'm going to be confused. Why? Because I don't have eyes to see and ears to hear. That's what he used to say to his disciples. Do you still not have eyes to see and ears to hear? See, so with this, we have to cleanse ourselves from the world. We have to allow him to cleanse our, cleanse our hearts by serving him. So then he begins to teach, and then it goes on to say, a house of prayer for all nations. So we find out that he wants his house a house of prayer. What's that? Prayer without ceasing. And drawing away in sacrificial time in God and prayer in his word. They come together. That's what we should do. Prayer is always an ignition to Jesus Christ. We must re remain in prayer and in his word. Hallelujah. So with that, he made a robber. He says, you made it a robber's den. So robber's den, it actually goes on to say uh, a den of robbers actually inside the King James. Den there can mean hiding place. So what was he saying? Behind the scenes, you're remaining the same, but in public, you're different. What he was saying right there is that we must change everything to conform to his image in the private and in public. We can't just do it in public. We have to seek him and strive to know him in the secret place and in public. Because right here, he goes on to say that these robbers we're behind the scenes, but it looks like there are Christians upon the scenes. And let's go ahead and continue. Number four, then he goes out and the tree withered. Mark 11, 19 to 26. When evening came, they would go out of the city. As they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Notice here, the roots up. It started from the root. So why were those people in the temple not bearing fruit? It was their root. Their root was not believing in Jesus Christ because what you believe in is what you're going to do. If I believe in Jesus, I'm going to follow Jesus no matter what. If I don't believe in Jesus, I won't. If my confession doesn't line up with my heart, I'm not going to do it. You see? So what happens is if I'm confessing Jesus is Lord, but my heart doesn't believe it, I'm going to turn away eventually. I'm not even going to serve him. I'm not even going to seek him as much. And I'm probably not going to obey him whatsoever. So with that, we begin to find out that our heart must line up with our confession. So if I say, I believe in Jesus, it's tested. Do you believe in Jesus? Because if you believe in Jesus, you won't give up on Jesus. So let's go ahead and continue on down. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you cursed has withered. Jesus answered, saying to them, have faith in God. Actually, the correct translation is not exactly have faith in God. It's have the faith of God. How do you have the faith of God? Becoming one with God. Because his faith is in you, and it produces great fruit. So now what we ask, we get, because we know one who is fruitful, and that's Jesus Christ. So it goes on to say, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. So now we're finding out the confession with the heart lines up. If you don't doubt, so if I'm saying the confession, I'm doubting, inside of my heart, is it going to happen the same way? But if I have him line up in God, it's going to happen. It says it will be granted to him. Therefore, I say to you, all things which you pray and ask, believe you have received them, and they will be granted to you. Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father who is in heaven will also forgive you your transgressions. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive your transgressions. So what is he saying right here? For unforgiveness keeps us from getting the things of God. It keeps us from having the faith of God keeps us from believing in God, unforgiveness does. That's a big one. That's a big one. That's why we're to release forgiveness towards all people. And if we don't know how, it, as soon as it comes back, we remind ourselves that we have already given that to Jesus Christ and we confess it unto the Lord. And he pulls us closer to him through his word. The more I read his word, it's going to renew my mind. 
and his spirit's going to renew my strength because I meditate on it. It's not only reading it, it's meditating on the word is going to help you to forgive people. Meditating on his word is going to help you succeed in life. True success is in Jesus Christ. If you have that, you have everything because Jesus will give all things unto you. But if you don't abide in him and him in you, what you get given will be stolen from you because it will be a robber that takes it and it will be the enemy. So we would abide in him as he is in us. I come to find out it's our focus point. Most people say, I don't know how to be delivered. I don't know how to do this. One reason, what's your focus point? Are you meditating on the scripture day and night? Well, I don't know how to do that. Get one scripture and think about it and ponder on it and begin to ask Jesus what it means and ponder on it and meditate on it. If we can meditate worry, we can meditate the scripture. It ain't no different. If you can sit there and worry about your struggles and everything else, you can meditate scripture. And that will bring life and your struggles will bring death. How do you get out of meditating on your struggles? You read the scripture and you get a scripture and you think about it over and over and over and over again. Or you think about something that brings life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, and everything. Thank you, Jesus, in all circumstances. We meditate on these things to provoke the Holy Spirit to come and heal our heart and release these things from our heart. He's the only one that can do it. But it's our job to get closer to him as he draws near to us. Remember, he drew near to you to bring you towards him. Then the book of James in chapter 4 goes on to say, draw near to him and he will draw near to you now. So now our job is to draw near to him and his job now is to draw near to us and cleanse our heart as we draw near to him because we learn surrender through that. So with this, we need to make sure as we stand praying, we have no unforgiveness in our heart because if we do, it can hold us back from him. We don't need that. We need to be successful in Jesus. We need to have breakthrough in Jesus. We need to have great faith in Jesus. We don't need something that's going to break our faith. These things break our faith. It's not worth it. It's not worth it. It's not worth your peace. It's not worth you losing peace. No, definitely not. I hope this has blessed you. I hope this brings understanding. Because right here goes on to say that if we allow Jesus to work in our hearts, he will come in and cleanse it all out and be able to teach us new things for us to understand into our heart. And this is the exact way that he has chose to teach us it. Hallelujah. God bless you.